everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, we have uh, Kevin Bradley here to uh, lead us on our next Facebook uh, live event. And his special guest is uh, Dr. Casey Lee from Palo Alto, California. Uh, Dr. Lee is an ENT surgeon, uh, oral and maxillofacial surgeon, uh, facial plastic and reconstructive uh, surgeon as well. And his uh, practice uh, deals mostly in regards to uh, treating people with various types of sleep apnea techniques. Uh, you may recognize Dr. Lee. He joined us uh, at our summit that we had in San Francisco last September in 2019. He was part of the multidisciplinary team uh, that spoke there. So we're happy to have him uh, join us again. I will let Kevin go ahead and uh, pick it up from here. Great. Thank you, Justine. And uh, welcome, Dr. Lee. Like Justine said, we're really happy and quite honored that you're taking the time out to join us and help educate some of our people out there in the community about certain options and opportunities they may have for their sleep apnea. Thank you for having me. Welcome. So I think I'll just start with um, reiterating like some of the common risk factors and symptoms for people with obstructive sleep apnea. Would you mind just reviewing some of those for our audience? Sure. Well, um, there are multiple, multiple factors that contribute to sleep apnea. Obviously, uh, weight is uh, always in the top uh, you know, uh, uh, risk factor. Um, weight, thick neck, uh, ethnicity can play a role. Uh, Far East Asians, uh, Hispanics, African Americans tend to have increased risk factors as uh, compared to Caucasians. Um, but obviously, everyone um, can carry some risk factors. Um, hereditary, meaning that genetics, um, fa family members uh, have uh, increased risks when one fam other family member has sleep apnea. Structural, that's because uh, you know we look like our parents or brothers and sisters. Um, you know, facial structures, uh, airway structures can contribute to narrowing of the airway and contribute to sleep apnea. Um, Gender, uh, in general, men have high risk factors until menopause, and then the then you know the uh, the uh, incidence of sleep apnea so uh, equals out between men and women. That is because uh, menopause, you know, with the uh, reduction of uh, estrogen progesterone, that contributes to increased collapsibility of the airway um, uh, in women post menopause, even perimenopausal. Uh, so that's some of the some of the risk factors that uh, contribute to sleep apnea. Great, great. Can I just um, take one point that you mentioned, and maybe we could just expand a little bit on that. And you know, it is a question that I see a lot in our um, Facebook pages, and people are concerned that how would the structure, how does the structure of your face affect that and affect your risks? Okay, we could take from top to bottom. So let's say on the face, it starts with the nose. Okay, we're obligatory nasal breathers when, they're, when we're born. And nasal breathing is the most efficient and comfortable way of breathing. Okay, so uh, when people are born with uh, constricted nasal apertures, they could be born with a uh, deviated septum that obstructs their nasal cavity. And uh, they can have allergies or just naturally enlarged nasal turbinates. So a lot of the nasal structures can contribute to uh, sort of deficiency in terms of how one can breathe through their nose. Uh, people with small jaws, including the upper and lower jaws, see that the, the airway is confined by bony structures, the upper airway, meaning that our spines in the back, uh, jaw structures in the front. The distance between the spine and the jaws uh, defines the size of the airway. If one has a small jaw, meaning that the jaw did not grow forward uh, sufficiently, they tend to have smaller airways. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to say that everyone with small jaws will, will have sleep apnea, but uh, that tends to, uh, uh, tends to develop a smaller airway and can increase the risk factor, or increase the risk of developing sleep apnea. Um, those are generally the, the, the facial structures that we talked about, uh, you know, the nose, the upper lower jaw, in contributing to 
in contributing to a smaller airway and increase the risk uh, of sleep apnea. Sure. So, you know, for someone that is walking around um, with sleep apnea and does use a machine, a CPAP machine at night, I guess the correlation with some people that they don't understand is how come they breathe fine during the day and it's just at night where they need this therapy? Well, uh, hence the name of uh, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. It only occurs when we sleep. That is because when we are awake, we have all the muscle tone. I'm sitting here, I'm talking to you, uh, so, so, and I'm breathing comfortably. That is because the muscle tone in, in my airway is maintained. Now, when we go to sleep, uh, we lose our muscle tone. And the deeper sleep that we go into, the more our muscle relaxes. Everyone hears about uh, the REM sleep. Obviously, uh, that's when our muscles really relax and collapse. So since the airway is a compliant tube, when I say compliant tube, that means that the, line, the lining and the walls of the airway is maintained by muscles. So when the muscle relaxes, it becomes floppy and reduces in size. Therefore, the airway becomes smaller when we're asleep and and we struggle to breathe and that sleep apnea and and there are really two major components one is the size of the airway the other the other component really is the collapsibility of the airway okay a neuromuscular collapse is a major component uh, that contributes to sleep apnea when, when when we're asleep sure sure great and so if I just go back to your practice now, um, can you just maybe tell us a little bit about the general population that you see and treat in your office? Do you find that you're, it's mostly adults or pediatric or a combination of both? And are, is it familial, like we'd suggested and said earlier? Um, do you find that you're treating family members? Sure. Um, first, anybody can have sleep apnea. That does not mean that everyone has sleep apnea, but anybody can have sleep apnea. You know, we always, again, when we talked about risk factor, we talked about weight. Just because someone is very thin, that doesn't mean that one does not have sleep apnea. So that's a very important factor. You know, the, 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 the old saying, oh, you know, you're, you're so thin, you can't have sleep apnea. That's just absolutely wrong. Okay. So. I see people from all walks of life and all different, you know, I live in the Bay Area. So, you know, we have a very heterogeneous population. Uh, and uh, I see, I've seen uh, six months old with sleep apnea. And, you know, in general, sleep apnea gradually worsens as we age, which is a very important um, thing to know. And we see you know, elderly with sleep apnea. Actually, majority of the elderly have certain degree of sleep apnea. So yes, I see children and adults, uh, different ethnic group, different size and shapes. Um, again, a anybody can have sleep apnea. Sure. So when you do see people in your office and they come for a consultation, what sort of opportunities or options are out there for someone? Um, Although I am a surgeon, I'm a, I'm a physician and dentist, I'm, I'm, I'm a care provider first. Okay? So I always view my job as um, really I want to educate my patients. You know, I want to identify problems and do what I can to try to improve their health, to help them. So even, even though I am a surgeon, many patients that come in to see me, uh, I would not offer surgery, but really to guide them and to educate them into the best treatment uh, choice that's best suited for them. Okay, so number one, obviously, is diagnosis. Talk about treatment, treatment. Uh, um, talk about risk factors and that sort of thing. And uh, the only way to diagnose sleep apnea is with a sleep study. Okay, just because someone has multiple risk factors that uh, they are, they have symptoms that are consistent with, consistent with sleep apnea, uh, I may say that there is a, a very high probability of having sleep apnea. The only way that we could label someone of having sleep apnea is after a sleep study that has diagnosed someone with sleep apnea. Okay, and obviously we all 
we all know the first line treatment option for sleep apnea is a nasal CPAP. Uh, and my job as a surgeon is to educate them about their what is the most you know, uh, utilized treatment option. And uh, even though some surgery may be able to replace the CPAP, I view my job as trying to uh, offer them options to try to have limited procedure, if need be, to try to improve their ability to use the CPAP and benefit from CPAP. Because at the end of the day, as we get older, sleep apnea gradually worsens as we get older, and the CPAP, can, the pressure can be adjusted so that it's kind of like my good friend, Rafael Paleo, who's, who's at, been at Stanford for a long time, he you know, early on, he used to always tell patients, you know, wearing CPAP is like wearing glasses, okay? As your vision changes, you're going you're gonna to change your prescription, just like CPAP. As, as your sleep apnea gets worse, they, we can adjust this pressure to still maintain the efficacy of CPAP. As a surgeon, sometimes people can tolerate CPAP. Sometimes their nose is uh, too obstructed to tolerate CPAP. Sometimes their pressure is too high to be comfortable. And we could do limited surgery, such as nasal surgeries or what have you, to uh, open up uh, the airway to a certain degree. Not that it would take away or dramatically change the uh, severity of CPAP, but improve their ability to tolerate uh, a very conservative uh, treatment option, which is nasal CPAP. Now, beyond CPAP, there are other types of surgeries that can be done um, from removing some tissues to more invasive surgeries such as moving the jaws and what have you. But when, when we talk about surgery, the most important consideration is patient selection. Okay. One procedure may be best suited for patient A and maybe uh, a very poor treatment option for patient B because there's the age factor, there's the anatomy factors, there's the the severity of sleep apnea factor. There are a lot of factors that goes into a decision in terms of offering certain treatment options that may be best suited for, for an individual patient. So my job as a, as a physician is really to present all the available treatment options and all the possible outcomes for that specific patient. Not just sort of spill out, oh, you know, jaw surgery success rate is 80, 90%. While it may be Maybe that for a certain certain patient, but not for all patients. Right, great. And I mean, I guess a surgical procedure always comes with its risk factors as well, and comorbidities on top of that can lead to to a decision whether that's an option or not. I'm sure. Um, you know, I think a lot of people think too. Like we talked about earlier on about misconceptions about who suffers from sleep apnea, you know, the idea of someone being overweight, thick neck, um, mainly the male population. It's not really widely known out there that pediatric patients can have this issue. Um, do you see that a lot in your office? And is that becoming um, an increased population that you're seeing as awareness is out there? Or has that always been the case? Absolutely. Um, a lot of children have sleep apnea because you know, even, uh, you know, I, I always tell patients that people are born with sleep apnea, okay, other than because that's our anatomy. That's our airway anatomy. So some people are born with smaller airway than others. And like I said, I've seen, you know, I've treated um, six months olds with sleep apnea. And I see a lot of, a lot of kids, and especially a lot of teenagers with sleep apnea, a lot of young adults with sleep apnea. And they may have, uh, you know, they may, be, they may be very healthy otherwise, and they're not overweight, but they have symptoms of sleep apnea, and they are diagnosed with sleep apnea. Uh, from you know, kindergarten all the way up to, you know, as I mentioned, that they all, they come from patients, any patient could have potentially have sleep apnea, it doesn't matter their age, size, or weight. And children, in general, the symptoms tend to change as kids get older. A lot of times, um, you know, I've worked with Christian Gimenol uh, the past 25 years, as you all know that he, he passed away the months ago, uh, and that he was a, a, a great proponent of helping children. 
Uh, he was the first to describe pediatric sleep apnea. And that in kids, you know, um, the peak incidence tends to be about it, that we identify sleep apnea as somewhere around age five or six-ish. Uh, often it's, they move around a lot. The symptoms are they, they move around a lot in bed when they sleep. Um, they, they may snore a little bit. A lot of times it's hyperactivity. Okay, they could have hyperactivity. And so that's some of the, the um, common symptoms in pediatric. And as they get older, they start to uh, develop uh, some of the adult symptoms, such as tiredness and fatigue. But often we see kids with hyperactivity that actually have sleep apnea. And usually we think about in kids, the first line treatment is adenotonsillectomy. Big tonsils, we take out the tonsils. In the old days, we'll say, okay, Tonsils, removal of tonsils is 100% curative. We get rid, of, get rid of sleep apnea right out the bat. But that just isn't true. You know, we can, we can help kids when we remove their tonsils. But a lot of times, as, as, we, as, a, as we previously talked about, patients could have small jaws, and they have small jaws, and uh, they still have small airway. Although kids um, after adenal tonsil, tonsillectomy, they may be improved. But when we follow them, there's a gradual relapse and worsening of sleep apnea as they get a little older. That's why earlier I talked about that I see a lot of teenagers with sleep apnea. And, that is be and they, they come in with uh, tiredness and fatigue, problem concentrating, that sort of thing. And, uh, so, and in those patients, uh, they've already had anotonsillectomy, and we choose other treatment options such as expansions, and, and often they they would uh, consider jaw surgery. Because CPAP in kids, uh, they can, although we, I have a lot of kids with CPAP, uh, they can develop some problems such as um, you know, affecting the facial growth because the pressure on the CPAP, uh, the pressure of the mass on a developing face and skeleton, they tend to be a little softer in kids so that that can uh, affect their facial growth. So we tend to follow on those kids uh, a little more carefully. Um, so that, in, in short, that's sort of the, uh, to answer your question, yes, I see uh, kids and adults, and I see family members. Uh, for example, I've done, I think my number, uh, I, one time I've done, I've done uh, three adenal tonsillectomies in a day on, in the same family. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because the risk factors are increased in a particular family um, because of the genetics. So that uh, a lot of times siblings, I see siblings, I see mom and dad or parents and, and kids in, in the same family. Thank you for that. And um, I'll go over to Justine. Do you have a question for us? Yes, I, I wanted to ask the doctor, um, what is the difference between UARS and sleep apnea? I hear that term a lot. And I'm, I think it's upper airway resistance syndrome, if I even have the, the letters uh, correct. And, and what is the difference between that and, and, and the treatment options that are out there? Okay. Well, uh, again, I talked about Christian Gimenold and uh, UARS was described by Christian uh, uh, years ago. And uh, just a little bit of history. Christian was absolutely mocked by the sleep community because majority of people did not believe in UARS. UARS, uh, you know, the way Christian described it was that it is a phenomenon due to increased resistance in the upper airway. Usually that population tends to be women, thin, which is not, not typical for people with sleep apnea. Um, you know, they, don't, they don't obstruct meaning that their AHIs are low. They tend to have more of an autonomic presentation. They have cold hands and cold feet. They tend to faint, low hypotension, um, orth orthostatic hypotension. And they, have, uh, and they have just a lot of fatigue, okay? Uh, they don't necessarily snore. So th those are some of the, some of the um, description of the UARS symptoms. So that... Uh, again, one of the some of the key features are that they that one, they have fatigue, but they don't have the typical obstruction. So that what it is that because their airway is small, 
and that they're not overweight so that they're, they can fight. Okay. So they can, and we breathe uh, just a little bit of physiology. We breathe by negative, pr negative pressure. What that means is that we increase our effort to suck air into our lungs. So our upper airway really is kind of like a straw. Okay. So with it, when we increase our effort to breathe, we, we increase negative pressure in our airway. So because the airway is small, that the effort of breathing causes arousal. It disrupts sleep. So that's upper airway resistance syndrome. Now in sleep apnea, it's really about collapse, collapse of the airway. Okay. But you know, I, when patients ask me a URS or a sleep apnea, I, I, I don't make a huge distinction because the treatment is the same. CPAP, surgery, the oral appliance, and what have you. So I, I, I try not to make, um, you know, make a huge point about whether someone has URS or sleep or OSA because the treatment is the same. One thing that can be difficult with the UARS patient is to get treatments approved because these patients tend to have low AHIs and uh, for all the insurance company, their treatment criteria or approval criteria depends on AHIs. And a lot of times require letter write, writing, appeals and what have you. And uh, would the insurance company try to, to try to get the treatment of treatments approved for UARS patients. Okay. Wow. Great. That's great educational piece for people out there that may be going through that and, and think that, you know, my sleep study came back where my AHI is fine. And, but why am I still feeling like this? Um, so that's, that's great advice. I do want to make one point about sleep studies. Okay. Um, just, and Sometimes it's it, it may be uh, a low, a bit of a sensitive topic. Uh, whether you want to include this or not, it's, it's up to you. Um, not all sleep, although sleep studies, the way that one interprets it, um, should be standardized. But I can tell you that um, there are good sleep techs. There are not good, not so good sleep techs. There are good sleep physicians, and there. So so sleep physicians, just like there are so so surgeons and there are good surgeons, right? Uh, there are not infrequently I would get patients. I would patients would come to see me where they would say, "Well, I had sleep studies where I was told that I do not have sleep apnea, and but I have all the symptoms of sleep apnea." My first question in any, every patient that comes in to see me is that. What kind of sleep study was done and where was it done? Okay. So, um, just, so I think it's important for patients to know that if you have all these that are consistent with sleep apnea, yet your sleep study may show minimal sleep, sleep apnea, you may want to get another sleep study and, and get a second opinion um, because I, I see that, you know, not infrequently. Sure. You know, and I think that's a great idea to let people know that, you know, it's not just something like we were talking about earlier, that facial characteristics or structures are the be all to diagnose any sort of condition. It's all taken into one big um, interview with the client or patient to say, well, what are the symptoms? Tell me what you're feeling, despite the fact that your sleep study showed this. We still feel that you've got a syndrome that requires treatment. Like you said, I mean, it may just be a little bit of a, an issue when you're trying to push this through to an insurance company for approval. Um, but again, like you said, I mean, if letters support that with a, a diagnosis per se, then hopefully that'll help people out there that need that. Yes, and, and uh, unfortunately, in this day and age, you know, and, and that's what, and really is what uh, you folks are doing or your fine work is education. And, and today, Patients have to be their own advocate in this, in this environment. And unfortunately, you, everyone needs to put, you know, as patients, we have to put in more effort, you know, in educating ourselves and be our own advocate in seeking and finding out what are the best treatment approach and, and uh, deal with insurance companies and what have you. And that's what has come to today. 
Sure. Sure. You know, and I feel with some of the information that's shared today, and again, we really greatly appreciate that. Um, it may be, you know, I'm sure it'll raise questions about what opportunities are out there for people seeking surgical intervention. Um, and maybe um, if willing, we could do maybe another segment on some of those and, and just look at maybe the ease procedure or the mandibular surgery, if that's what people are looking for. Um, any anything else that we haven't touched upon that you'd like to highlight? Um, I think it's, um, we sort of uh, had a general discussion about risk factors and what one can do about sleep studies. Um, you know, beyond that, when we talk about treatment, um, I, I think we touch on it, but. CPAP, I think, is an excellent treatment for most adults. Um, but if one cannot use or tolerate CPAP, then there are other treatment approaches that are available and that can be very efficacious for the right patient. Um, and I think that is, um, I think it's a topic, be, uh, like you mentioned, uh, some of the surgical procedures. I think that's another topic. But I think that uh, the first thing we have to do is uh, really education, pa educating patients, uh, for patients to know, um, to try to be diagnosed uh, w uh, if they have symptoms. And I think this is a uh, really, you folks are doing a great job in educating the public about uh, what they can do. So, right. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to just, if I could ask one quick question. Um, you know, this is going to air while everyone is... Um, paying attention and, and involved with the coronavirus and everyone's life is kind of uh, changing a little bit in regards um, to that. And um, I, I was wondering if you could maybe speak to the importance of, of getting sleep and good sleep and, and, and your, and your ability and your immunity and your ability to, to, you know, be the, I don't know how to say it, the, 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 best, the best you can to fight off infections and so forth, that it is important that you, you know, stick to your treatment during this time. And, and I'll, I'll let you go. Sure. Um, you know, I, I often tell my patients, sleep is extremely important. Proper sleep and adequate sleep is extremely important. I often tell my patient, uh, all, all my patients that, Sleep, good sleep is source of happiness. If you don't sleep well, you're not going to have a good quality of life. You're not going to enjoy life. You tend to be um, more likely to get sick and what have you. One, most people lack adequate sleep. Okay. In general, you should, uh, you know, some people need more, some people need less. But you should get, you know, uh, as adults, seven, seven to nine hours sleep. Um, and this day and age, you know, with the coronavirus, I think a lot of people are anxious and it's going to affect their sleep. Uh, I think that it's, I would tell you that, you know, as a surgeon, which is atypical, I, I often meditate, you know, to help myself, you know, to relax and, and get a good quality, good night's sleep. Uh, especially in kids. Well, now, now they're home because they're, they're, the school shut down for weeks and they're able to get adequate sleep. Um, when my son was going through the, you know, high school, a lot of times high school kids don't get enough sleep. I always tell him that you know, he needs to just stop, stop with his homework. To me, a good sleep is more important than completing your homework. And that's how strongly I believe in having quality of sleep. If you do not sleep well, uh, you're, you're at an in, uh, increased risk of being sick because your immunity is affected. Uh, sleep apnea increases what we call the inflammatory state. It worsens your diabetes. It worsens your high blood pressure. It worsens your cardiovascular health. Um, it makes uh, your overall general health worse if you're not getting good sleep. Um, so especially t uh, today, uh, with the scare of coronavirus, you want to 
maximize your uh, immune defense, you know, your immunity. So one has to, you know, I, 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 every patient after I do, uh, after I operate on them for their sleep apnea, I always tell them, you know, I've done my job. My job is to do a good operation, minimize complications, and to take good care of you. Once that is done, I said, now it's your job, okay? Because when I treat patients, I tell everyone, we're a team. I'm going to do, do the best that I can, do my job, but you have a job. You have to do what I ask you to do to be a good patient, to improve your recovery, to maximize your outcome. And that's not just right after surgery. That's long-term, meaning that exercise, live clean, be healthy, eat well, and sleep and get adequate sleep. Because remember I mentioned that you know, sleep progresses as we age. So as a patient, one needs to do whatever he or she can to lessen the gradual worsening of sleep apnea. And that and number one, that one we could do is to eat well, exercise, and get plenty of sleep. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, and I think, you know, there is a lot of anxiety out there, and that can affect someone's sleep first off. And, um, you know, that advice is great, as well as all the other recommendations that are coming out there with, you know, washing your hands and not avoiding large crowds and stuff. But pay particular attention to your, your sleep hygiene and health, which is great. Um, any closing remarks or um, announcements, Justine? I know this is going to be um, pushed to our Awake Facebook um, and our pages on uh, March 17th, which so happens to be St. Patrick's Day. So happy St. Patrick's Day. To <laughs> you all have a our... perfect accent. There you go. <laughs> happy St. Patrick's Day to my fellow Irish people. And um, I know there's some other events coming up. I'd like you to just um, make, make that announcement, please. Yes, sure. So, uh, yeah, this will air on the on the 17th. And then um, later that week on March 20th will be Sleep Apnea Awareness Day, which is, is a great um, prelude to that, uh, raising more awareness about how the condition can, can run in families, what options are out there, how it affects uh, children. And um, so I was really happy to have uh, Dr. Lee be able to make some time and, and join us today. And, uh, and then we're also going to be getting some information out there about our uh, virtual webcast summit that we're going to be having in, uh, in May. So that'll be a great opportunity for us to be very much in a, a medium like this so we can have conversations with experts like Dr. Lee and others, and we can all do it from the comfort of our homes uh, and uh, still get all of that information that, that we need. So we'll be getting that, that out there as well. Great. And of course, Justine, Teresa, and myself will all be in the wings when this is pushed live for any comments and questions you may have and any suggestions for further um, topics that we could, um, su- you could suggest that we discuss. So once again, thank you so much, Dr. Lee. I really appreciate your very honest and open and frank discussion. And, um, you know, it's very educational for our general population out there. And um, hopefully we look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, Justine. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Mm-hmm.